It isn't often I ever have to give a spoiler warning for an academic paper, so please know that I will be discussing aspects of the end of Bioshock Infinite. There's always a lighthouse. I chose this phrase because it expresses a profound image in the suite of Bioshock games, and especially in Bioshock Infinite. Narratively, this phrase is both literally true and metaphorically true. There really is always a lighthouse. Our heroes Booker and Elizabeth literally traverse a sea of lighthouses, each leading to another reality. See? Not stars. They're doors. Doors to... To everywhere. All that's left is the choosing. But like all impactful imagery, the lighthouse also acts as a symbol indicative of the player's dawning awareness, an enlightening, if you will, of the fundamental plot device of the game, that the notion of time and place and reality are much more fluid than we at first suspect. Likewise, the symbolism of the lighthouse plays out in the music, and in fact, featured rather prominently in the release of the official score from Bioshock 2 entitled Sounds from the Lighthouse. For me, playing Bioshock Infinite was like peeling an onion. There always seemed to be another layer of meaning below the surface. That, and by the end I found myself tearing up. I had anticipated some engaging storytelling through irony-laced music heard within the game world, much as I had enjoyed in Bioshock. The diegetic music in that game, as William Gibbons has observed, was riddled with irony and narrative commentary. But that same music also served to immerse players in the zeitgeist of mid-century America. I could believe I was in rapture because of creaking girders, leaking windows, and most assuredly because of the uncanny echoes of the ink spots drifting down penumbral corridors. But what I got from Bioshock Infinite was not what I thought I wanted. There were some stark differences between the Columbia of Infinite and the rapture of Bioshock. For one, at the time of our respective visits, Columbia is more truly dystopic than rapture, which might be more aptly thought of as post-apocalyptic. The horror of Bioshock's musical commentary is a posteriori, Whereas we see the horror unfolding before us in Infinite, in a very real way, we can hear it coming. For example, I heard some familiar songs redressed to fit in 1912. One was a song piping out of a calliope at the beach. Another sounded like the Beach Boys, who were, strangely enough, not at the beach. If you should ever leave me, will life will still go on, believe me. The world is such a nothing to me, so, so what good would living do? If we only listen for the style of music, these songs could be considered immersive. But the melodies and lyrics tip us off, and we are confronted with the uneasiness of the contradiction. The game becomes unimmersive. I became hyper-aware that while I played as Booker DeWitt, I was not he. I was being fed a subtle commentary on the game world that simultaneously used song to color my experience of the game world, and the game world to reinterpret the message of the songs. There is no way I can adequately address everything that could be said of the game's narrative reappropriation of popular songs, but I will do my best to hit some of the salient moments in three songs used in the game. The very first musical portents of the story to come occur before the game has even begun. At the start screen, we see in the background a peaceful Colombian street, a scene of Americana, with After You've Gone wafting out of someone's window. This song is only slightly anachronistic, coming to us from 1918. Like so many of the songs that infiltrate this version of 1912, the love articulated can be interpreted not as romantic love, but as the love between a parent and a child, or between close friends. 
as the start menu's background music, After You've Gone, seems at first to simply add to the immersive ambiance of the world, but that simplistic interpretation is drastically transformed once the game has finished. The player sits stunned through the credits, only to be thrust back to the start menu and this song. All of a sudden, the lyrics in general, and the title in particular, mean something more. At once, the song is infused with other implications, reminding the player not of the song's original intentions, but of the experiences of the game narrative. Even the start menu, a perfunctory and even annoying delay that begins all video games, becomes a part of the narrative and part of the experience. The reverberation, at first simply ambiently muddying words, now bears the freight of the emotional journey we've experienced. It lends a sense of the unattainable, the distant, and heightened longing. If YouTube comments are any indication, this is a common reaction, and I particularly like the phrases, it's just crazy that a video game did this to me, and now I'm here listening to a song from the tens as if I'd lived them. It is unclear if one should hear the speaker as Booker or as Elizabeth, and indeed ambiguity is part and parcel with the whole game. I think one's perception can actually change over the course of the game, since this is the music that reintroduces you to Columbia every time you return to play. Initially, I heard the song from Booker's point of view, as I gained an increasing awareness of his sense of loss, first nebulously, and then narrowing in on the loss of a girl, this Anna, perhaps, and then specifically of his giving up his baby daughter. Later in the game, after Songbird has swept Elizabeth away and Booker finds himself in another alternate universe in which Elizabeth has been tortured and conditioned to be the new despotic leader of Columbia, I began to hear the song as Elizabeth's voice. We hear the audio logs of her mental breakdown as she gives in to the feelings of Booker's abandonment. By the time the game is ended and we hear it after the credits roll, I cannot tell whose perspective it depicts more, Booker for Elizabeth's drowning him, or Elizabeth for having done so. However, perhaps the first in-game hint that something is amiss in Columbia, that floating heaven on earth that is neither truly in heaven nor truly on earth, is in this well-publicized moment I've already referenced. Many of us are familiar with this song, and at first encounter with it in-game we might tend to have the same reaction to it as we normally would, other than surprise at the stylistic change. It's a love song expressing how life's not worth living without the one you love. However, given its presence in 1912, mightn't there be more to it than that? GameSpot's article The Caged Bird Sings, Five Musical Covers in Bioshock Infinite, suggests the intended subtext refers to Columbia's denizens' adoration of Comstock, their political and religious leader. Under this rubric, the song insinuates their collective opinion that they might not go on living without him, because he has created this utopia for them. Certainly the writer of the article realizes that the meaning of the song has been reinterpreted by the environment, and I think that much we can agree on, but I believe... This is a rather shallow reading of the song's meaning and purpose in the game. Throughout, Booker is confronted with memories neither he nor we can quite understand. This song speaks of Booker, not Comstock, although the irony of that statement is apparent to those who have completed the game. For those who haven't, don't worry, I'll spoil it in just a moment. Let's look at the lyrics. I've highlighted phrases that I think are particularly relevant to a reading that is Booker-centric rather than Comstock-centric. But long as there are stars above you. In Colombia, we never see the stars. They are always eclipsed by sunlight or clouds. The only place in game that we see the stars is the Sea of Doors. Each star is, in fact, a lighthouse, a beacon to another reality. Now, the song begins to inform our interpretation of the narrative. As long as there are realities in which Booker hasn't tried to save Elizabeth, she need never doubt his care for her. Add to that the phrase, I'll make you sure about it. If it is true, as has been suggested by various enthusiasts, that this is Booker's 122nd attempt at rescuing Elizabeth, evidenced by various clues littering the game, then he has been doing exactly as the song hints. As long as there are stars, or realities to attempt, he will make Elizabeth sure of how much he loves her. Because God only knows what he'd be without her. Fortunately, so do we. He would be Comstock. There. I said it.
The booker that chooses baptism as a young man and never sires a child becomes Comstock. Comstock kidnaps Elizabeth from his alternate self, the booker we play as. As such, we see what booker becomes when he has no children of his own, Comstock, and what he becomes when his child is taken from him, a depressed drunk. This particular lyric may also relate to a bit of dialogue that featured in the game trailer, the opening of the game itself as a kind of epigraph, and later during the course of the game. Are you afraid of God? No. I'm afraid of you. There is an obvious comparison between God and Elizabeth's godlike powers, and like God, Elizabeth knows what Booker would be without her. These phrases of the song are particularly haunting given the end of the game. Indeed, after baby Elizabeth was taken from him, Booker's life did go on, but in a miserable state. In the end, we learn that the only way to stop the repeating pattern of having her stolen away is for Booker to die, thus ending the possibility of Comstock ever existing. If you should ever leave me, what good would living do me? The song's meaning is radically altered in the mouths of this barbershop quartet. In turn, the song subtly gives us a great deal of information about what is swiftly coming in Booker's future, which, if we are aware, dramatically alters our perception of the game world we experience early on. These transformations of meaning are impossible if we are not in the know, which is one of the attributes that makes this game well worth a replay. It is impossible to play Bioshock Infinite without noticing the particular narrative role of Will the Circle Be Unbroken, one of the few songs featured in the game that would have been known in 1912. We hear this song three times over the course of the game, a fact which hints at its role as a musical narrative linchpin. The first time occurs upon arriving in Columbia. Throughout this first area, we hear the song reverberate around us in a serene environment of contemplation and religious devotion, much as the song would have been originally intended. At face value, it seems to simply immerse the player in the environment, much like the songs in the original Bioshock, through its slow, ethereal choral style. The second time occurs midway through the game, and only if the player happens to go into a particular basement in Shantytown, Columbia's slum district. Will the circle The mindful player will notice the changed tone and narrative role of the song. No longer is it immersive background music, now it seems to refer to the constants and variables that Elizabeth wishes so desperately to change as they hop among universes. Will the circle of war, destruction, and death they keep witnessing be unbroken? This moment also highlights the emotional bond between our protagonists Booker and Elizabeth, who are not passively aware of the music, but have agency in it. I like this, of course, simply for its storytelling, but even more so for the way it mirrors the player's growing awareness of his own agency in this story. For example, this moment doesn't even happen if the player does not explore, and then, upon seeing the guitar, choose to interact with it. So, too, the player's character, Booker, becomes increasingly aware of his own deeper-seated agency in the debacle in which he now finds himself. Finally, we hear the ethereal choral version of the song return at the end of the game, just behind one of the many lighthouse doors. Wait a minute. I know this place. I was here. It has been 20 years ago, right after Wounded Knee. I was looking for... Come on now, time's a waste. Why were you here? Are you ready to have your past erased? Are you ready to have your... At first, the music is less distinct, but by now, we have heard it enough to recognize the repetitive undulations of that melody. 
and we realize that the circle is not merely the religious lingo and atmosphere of the Welcome Center, nor merely universe hopping. It is those things, but also a metaphor for the two biggest reveals of the game. One, that we've just played out one iteration of hundreds of cycles trying to rescue Elizabeth from her captor, and two, that captor is yourself, the result of an alternate chain of events. In another sense, we have played this cycle before in the original Bioshock, summarized in Elizabeth's statement, There's always a lighthouse, there's always a man, there's always a city. Of course, the song is revisited once more during the credits, as one tries to wrestle with the complex end of the story. It is the complete version from which was excerpted the in-game guitar scene. This gives more of the song than players have yet heard, and with the game completed at this point, the impact of the lyrics is even greater. Phrases from every verse now bear plaintive relevance to the story we, as players, have just completed. There are, of course, the obvious references that we might have noticed long ago, phrases that might have once seemed like innocuous references to children, references to family, a recasting of the meaning of dying savior, and the question we are all left wondering, will Booker and Elizabeth ever get to be together again? Thus, the game begins and ends with the question, will the circle be unbroken? And since I began with the assertion that the songs and game narrative form a recursive loop that inform and interpret one another, this song seems a fitting place to end. So much more could be said about the other songs in Bioshock Infinite, the ironic twist on the already ironic shiny happy people that turns the hypocrisy of Chinese propaganda toward the hypocrisy of Colombia's racist leadership, the double-sided history of the Bonnie Blue Flag as both a Union and Confederate rallying call, the implication of women's liberation in Girls Just Want to Have Fun, and the clever reinterpretation of common love song words like baby to have both a literal and figurative meaning. This list is by no means exhaustive. Like 2007's Bioshock, real-world popular song is used diegetically to make ironic comment on the narrative. However, Infinite, to my mind, achieves greater poignancy by often favoring sincerity over tongue-in-cheek. These songs I've mentioned in particular play a more complex role than the songs in Bioshock. Original meanings of songs are reinterpreted by the game's events, and the game's narrative is likewise colored by the songs. Whereas the scope of what could be said on this topic and the songs that could be included far exceeds the limitations of this exploration, I trust it will serve to perpetuate the discussion.